Thank you guys all for coming. I'd like to introduce you to Rob Storr. He is a curator, as well as a curate, uh, critic, artist, professor. He um, is currently the dean at the Yale School of Design. In 2007, he curated the Venice Biennale. And for over 10 years, he was a senior curator at the Museum of Modern Art in the Department of Painting and Sculpture. He's written extensively on many artists, um, Gerhard Richter. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> <laughs> Bruce Nauman, Louis Bourgeois, the, the list goes on. And now, Ad Reinhardt. Um, let's see, without further ado, I leave it to you. I also want to say that after this um, walkthrough, Rob is available to sign um, copies of the book that we just published of art cartoons. It's the first time, or it, the cartoon book was made. Um, uh, it, it, it's the, the largest. Uh, writings on his work and um, the artist had wanted to in 1947 publish it himself and this is we are very honored to have done it here and Rob has an essay in it and um, he'll be available to sign the books after this talk. So, Great, good. Okay, um, a few preambles. First of all, I'm not going to make this over long. This is after all Saturday morning and you have other places to go and other things to see. I've done the gallery crawl, I know. Um, secondly, I, I ordinarily don't do exhibitions in galleries, but this is a special occasion and a special circumstance. Uh, I'm a museum guy and I have great respect for my dealer friends, but I think the separation of the two worlds is a good thing in general. But this is different because this is an entirely non-commercial show and it is a celebration of Ad Reinhardt's 100th year. So this is a chance to sort of bring to the attention of several new generations of collectors, artists, critics, people who have an eye on the world, uh, a body of work that they know a little bit and generally insufficiently, but about which there's a lot of opinion. And one of the, one of the aims of this show is to somewhat complicate the uh, set piece explanations of what Reinhardt was about, what his scope was, what his activity was, and so on. Um, and basically, this is also the labor of love of a number of, okay, now, that gentleman, by the way, is Chuck Close. <laughs> Uh, and he, he is, was just commenting about how, if you look at here, how to look at American art, he remembers every artist on this tree. I, I'm sorry to say, I do too. So uh, I think one of the parts of this show is it'll be a heads up for people who think that the art world was invented in 1980 or 1990 or whatever, that really the art world that we live in is still the living past of a great many different art worlds overlaid, always contentious always debating, always disagreeing. Everybody had their season and then there somebody else had the opposite season and everybody worried about whether they get another season. The, the art world is very little changed, it's just gotten a hell of a lot bigger. Um, and on this I will just digress very quickly. Uh, there's a great deal of discussion nowadays of so-called institutional critique, which having worked in institutions I heartily endorse. I happen to think that people who are in them do better critiques than people who are outside because people who are in them know more about how they actually work and how they misfire as well. But be that as it may, institutional critique of the art world uh, is, is a sort of big deal now among younger critics, younger artists, and so on. But this work here is institutional critique of a sharper, more acute, and much funnier nature than anything we have seen since. And uh, it's also, as I say, much sharper. Uh, Reinhardt had this amazing ability to deeply offend his dearest friends and retain their friendship. Uh, and I was reading the uh, introduction for a lecture he gave at Skowhegan back, I guess, sometime in the 60s. Uh, and he was introduced by Walter Murch, who's an artist that is little known these days, but was actually a fairly formidable artist in the 1940s and 50s, whose work, incidentally, Jasper Johns has collected. So he's somebody who's on the radar of other people with elephantine memories. Um, and, uh, Merch introduces uh, Reinhardt and says, this is Ad Reinhardt. Uh, uh, Robert Motherwell says you should listen to him because he's always right. And Ad Reinhardt got up and said, that's funny. Why is it that Robert Motherwell is always wrong? Now, 
I say this because, first of all, in 1950, Reinhardt and Motherwell together edited a very important document, which is a book called Modern Art in America, which was a bound magazine in which, for the first time in general circulation, the famous Studio 35 panel of the Abstract Expressionists was published, and it also was a sort of a gazette of all the exhibitions of recent memory of contemporary artists. By the way, very interesting reading for those of you who are art historians, because you will find many, many women having exhibitions in that period, and 10 years later, very many fewer. So that there's a, there's a real break when American art goes commercial, in a sense, and where the collecting community and the institutional community uh, doesn't express any interests in the uh, women who are in this gallery system, but actually the galleries uh, expressed a fair amount. And there's a, there's, a, there's a combing out that happens, which is a kind of surprise. A lot of other combings out, but I won't go into that. In any case, Ad Reinhardt was making this very, very sharp uh, examination and critique of the very institutions which were beginning to come gather around support and also significantly change our understanding of contemporary art just as it was happening. And he did it at considerable risk to himself and to his own career, to his friendships and so on and so forth. But as I said, he had this absolutely amazing sort of angelic wit. Um, so this room is devoted, and there are three rooms and I'll explain the logic. This room is devoted to Reinhardt's illustrations and cartooning. Next to uh, us is a room which is devoted to a slideshow which is one of a sampling of slideshows that could have run as long as Christian Marclay's The Clock. And I'll explain that in a second. And the third room is the real reason that we know Reinhardt, care about Reinhardt the most, which is the paintings that he made. But the purpose of the show is to put these pieces together and to understand that even as Reinhardt was very, very severe and very strict about what art was and what it was not, he also had a broad Catholic erudition and he was able, I don't mean Catholic and little c Catholic, you know, expansive, all encompassing, erudition and understood art in many dimensions that he himself did not endorse or practice. So that his, his critical mind worked parallel to and in a way to carve out the space for the things that he cared about the most, which were the paintings in the next room and all that preceded them. In general, Reinhardt has been treated in segments rather than whole. And this exhibition sort of puts him back together again not in order to raise these drawings up to the level of that painting so much, it's to say they coexist in the same man and that people indeed are as complicated as they are and it does them no service and their work no service to arbitrarily slice off one section or another and pay attention to only. And one of the ironies is what's happening now is that in a world which is heavily loaded with people who've been educated to think painting is dead and indeed to think that uh, Reinhardt's uh, late paintings, the black paintings, which you'll no, discover if you don't already know aren't black, um, are, are the terminus of that painting, right? That painting had to die, had to be killed in fact by a painter, um, that the candidates for the murder might be Robert Ryman, might be Gerhard Richter, might be this or that, it might be Ad Reinhardt. And since uh, Reinhardt said with I think tug deeply in cheek, I'm simply making the last paintings that anybody can make, knowing of course that he was going to get up the next morning and make another one, and it would be different than the one preceding, uh, that he said that and a certain body of critics and art historians who actually don't really like art very much anyway, most of them, um, have decided to use him as a weapon against painting. And the thing that you should come away from this is that for all that he had this critical sharp mind and it could in fact wound deeply people doing different kinds of other work, he did it in the service of painting, number one, and number two, he practiced the art of painting to his very last day. And that you have a person who believed firmly that painting was going to go on, and who believed firmly, firmly that he knew that others were going to do it in ways he disagreed with, and in a way he must have drawn some, I don't know, confidence or something from that. So, I'll tell you a little bit about the organization. This room is devoted to his illustrational and his cartoon work. Um, very little of this work has been seen in the flesh, uh, never before has as much of it been seen of all kinds. This side of the room is the part that's better known. This, these are the so-called art cartoons, most of which were published in PM, in, these are the uh, tear sheets from PM, or were published, which was a left-wing, believe it or not, a left-wing tabloid newspaper. And by the way, when Irving Sandler wrote for it, the New York Post was a center-left tabloid newspaper. So the age of uh, Rupert Murdoch has changed our map considerably. But once upon a time in this country, was, being liberal was being wishy-washy relative to the left rather than being pink 
as Mr. de Blasio showed up on the cover of the Post the other day with a hammer and sickle, rather than being pink against the mainstream. So we are living in a very different world than the one that Reinhardt was in, and that actually I was grown in, <laughs> born up in. Now, okay, you have art cartoons, sophisticated, detailed uh, art cartoons uh, in a tabloid newspaper in New York. Now, uh, Virgil Thompson, who wrote uh, Phil, uh, not, me, uh, music criticism for the Herald Tribune at that time, uh, had an adage, and he said, never underestimate the information, or overestimate the information that your audience has, and never underestimate their intelligence. And Reinhardt pretty much adhered to that idea in the way he approached these, because what he did is he provided a lot of information. These are educational. These are indeed didactic art. I mean, and if people don't like didactic art, they better rethink it, because these are first-rate didactic art. He is teaching a general audience about what has happened in art in this country and in Europe and in modernism generally. Uh, he gives you names, he groups people according to categories, he gives you ideas, he gives you a little glimpse as to the internal dynamics and debates. All of this is, you know, in a sense, educational work. And at the same time, he is editorializing constantly from his own position, and he's using this as a platform to advance an idea of art which is extremely strict and which is you know, sort of the, 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 the litmus test of a certain kind of abstraction in his generation and since, and I'll say something about that later. So this is, this is sophistication for the popular audience, and the idea that the two actually can go together, and that you don't talk down to your audience, and that you do educate them, and that you think they want to be educated, is vindicated by things like, for example, Herb and Dorothy Vogel the biggest collectors of conceptual and uh, minimal art in this country, whose collection is now the core of the National Gallery's collection. And Herb was a postman and Dorothy was a librarian and they lived on a civil service salary and spent the other civil service salary buying art. And like many people of their generation, they went to the settlement houses and uh, listened to lectures. For example, they listened to the lectures of Meyer Shapiro, Meyer Shapiro who was also the person that Ad Reinhardt listened to. And they went to the museums in the days when the Museum of Modern Art didn't cost $25 to go in. Uh, and they went to it like a public library all the time and absorbed what was going on. This is the culture that surrounds these things, okay? And it's a culture we no longer have, and frankly, I think it's a, a great loss. In any case, this part of the work has not been shown in this depth before. The other side of the room, I don't think much of anybody really knows. Cabinet, for example, you can see a variety of things that will speak to a variety of aspects. But either these are sketches, tree sketches, for further tree sketches which are there, which are the preparation for that one there, okay? So like a good uh, illustrator, commercial cartoonist, uh, Ed Reinhardt planned his moves, structured his page, lettered, and did all the things that, for example, Art Spiegelman does uptown at the Jewish Museum. So if you go see Art Show now, the correlation between Art Show and this show is really interesting. Um, so anyway, he, he lays it all out, and you'll notice, by the way, that he has a very fine hand. He uses small pens. These cartoons are tiny, some of them. They're like a little illumination. So this is a kind of exquisite uh, drawing of a sort that very few people have a mastery of now. One of his mentors was Carl Holty. Another more or less uh, model for him was Stuart Davis, and Stuart Davis had the same hand. And Stuart Davis drew for the masses, and uh, Ed Reinhardt draw, drew for the new masses. So that what we've got here is a master craftsman of the art of illustration and cartooning, and it is an art form. And I'm, again, clear that this is the art form he cared most about, but supposing you just happen to be superlative in two art forms, that's kind of the dilemma this show represents. Uh, in any case, this is a series of cartoon layouts. This is uh, the, the layout for a strike poster, and it has wonderful things. Sell out, artists sell out artists. Uh, enlist now, strike. I mean, this is kind of militant stuff, and again, I think we could use a little bit. Um, this is an example of uh, his uh, caricatures of other people. Documents of Modern American Art, which is a series of uh, books that were published after this uh, book that was done with Motherwell uh, and Bernard Capella, The Modern. Okay, so here he says, Archives of American Art censored from, its, from It Is Magazine, which was an abstract expressionist magazine. Robert Motherwell says, 1959, voyaging into the night one knows not where on an unknown vessel, an absolute struggle with the elements of the real. Okay, and this is, voyaging into the naught one knows exactly where on a known vessel in an absolute harmony with the elements of the unreal, Ed Reinhardt. Um, this is the famous one. There is no such thing as a good painting about nothing, Adolf Gottlieb and Mark Rothko, another friend of his. This is Reinhardt. There is no such thing as a good painting about something, 
and so it goes down the line. He plays with language, he uses it plastically, kind of like Bruce Nauman, and he plays with images, and he uses them as tools and occasionally as weapons. These are notes from uh, travels, and these are also notes from travels. He traveled a great deal, uh, and I will get to that in a second, but for example, these are just notes on the resistors and pylons of electrical lines along railroad tracks in Europe. And you can see it's a whole taxonomy of forms. It's beautifully done. These are notes, lecture notes, on uh, a variety of topics. And the top one here is, religion begins where theory ends. This is something we theoreticians of our day should remember. Um, these are postcards that Ad sent to his daughter, Anna. Uh, and they're recording the trips that he took and where he was. And this is a notebook with the diagrams of some of the travels. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. We could have used much more of this. And some serious art historian is going to have a field day uh, combing through all of this. And these are a series of page layouts. This is a good cartoonist figuring out how many words you can get into a text balloon and where you drop the text balloon into the image. Okay, So this is, this is professional work of the highest caliber. These here are the uh, paste-ups for a series that were done for Art News, the old Art News. Uh, and there are many of the same cartoons, and they involve uh, appropriated texts and made texts and appropriated images and made images and a lifetime supply of whiteout, which those of you who ever typed will know what that is. Uh, in any case, you can see a whole lot of things. This is a quotation directly from Durer, as is this. This is a quotation from Jacques Callot, the French Baroque printmaker. This is a quotation from Hogarth. And all the way through these things, you see him combing the visual literature, if you will, of caricature in the grand epics of caricature, which really were the Baroque, well, it was eight, you know, sort of 17th through the 19th century. And he, he lifts them out and he plugs them in and he adds text. And this, for example, um, Museum of Middlebrow Art, Alfred Barbecue, House of Fame. Uh, Ruth Miller, Art Rags to Riches, 200,000% uh, uh, increase in business value, and so on down. Now, this was not done by some kid fresh out of the Whitney program, right? Uh, and this was not done by somebody who has tenure at Yale. This was done by an artist in the mix of all of this, and he was, uh, he was really playing with fire. But they're wonderfully sort of tonic correctives. And so this is our favorites. This is based on a competition, not a competition, but an event where critics were asked who their favorite artists were, and he then played with the critics and their choices. And again, some of the barbs are pretty sharp. Bagels and Lukheim without a piece of salami. Okay, Lukheim was a critic for the New York Times. Bagels are bagels and locks, we know. And Salemi was a uh, surrealist painter who was an inspiration actually to Louise Bourgeois. Um, exhibition at Wildenstein, that's a name that rings a bell. Um, and so on down the line. All of these things are in jokes that then become general jokes because, as I said, the purpose was to educate his, his audience. Now, on this side, you get what precedes it, starting with the humble beginnings of being a college cut-up, right? Literally. These are images that he made, gouaches and, and collages, for the gesture, which was the Columbia University humor magazine. Uh, it would be working like working for the Harvard Lampoon and then going to Saturday Night Live or something like that, or Second City. I mean, that's, that's the sort of the, the, the origins of this. Uh, adolescent to young man humor, but also reminders that he was involved in a, a world which was as much in turmoil as ours. This is a lynching in the South. Now, this is a, a, a party announcement for PM, which was the uh, newspaper slash magazine he worked for. These are some more PM things. And then, beginning here, here is a PM. It says, war, 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 war. Here are a series of these things without the PM, sort of premonitions of that room. And Lurking underneath them are Hitler, Tojo, and Mussolini. All of this stuff is being done in the advent of the Second World War. And from here until pretty much the next corner, you see what America looked like through a somewhat whimsical lens when the world, in fact, was going to hell. Uh, and you see it from the point of view of somebody who's on the political left. He was never a Communist Party member. He was not an affiliated person. He was too much of the independent in all respects to do that. But he did, in fact, publish his drawings in New Masses, which was a more or less Stalinist magazine. He published them in PM, which was a uh, left-wing newspaper, albeit one financed by 
the uh, Marshall Field Company, uh, or the Marshall Field Air in Chicago, and coming from Chicago, and anybody else who comes from Chicago knows that Marshall Field was incredibly right-wing. So the paradoxes of, of you know, having yourself in a left-wing newspaper paid for by a right-wing patron is kind of like what goes on today. You know, like, for example, Rupert Murdoch is the one who sponsors The Simpsons. Okay? So anyway, this is, this is uh, the beginnings of this, and then all of this here basically is about the war. Images of Hitler, images of Mussolini, images of Winston Churchill. Here we have, uh, we have um, uh, Spanish dictator. Franco. Franco. Um, and so on. This is, this is a wolf in sheep's clothing. This is see no here, no ear, no evil, except it's fascism, and so on. This is I, one of my favorites, actually, which is this eye watching these sort of insects crawling, and the insects take the form of swastikas. Now, these, again, are beautifully drawn, very small. Uh, they are the uh, antithesis of the rhetorical version of some of the same ideas that you find in post office murals, that you find in poster work at this time, and so on. There's a delicacy and a refinement to these things that is an interesting uh, tension with, with their political message, which is pretty standard left-wing stuff of the time. On the other hand, pretty standard left-wing stuff at the time was better than most of what else was being said at the time. So you see somebody working out a complex relationship to public politics in a, in a highly personalized form. And so it goes. This is the war effort, his own military service in the Navy, I mean, they're invoked, they're not exactly depicted. This is Dewey, this is Roosevelt. So this is a bit of a left-wing challenge to Roosevelt, um, something one might have now of Obama, for example. Um, this is uh, 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 um, John L. Lewis, who is a labor leader. This is, this is capitalism as a beneficent force in the world, except no. Um, and this, and so it goes down, this is all economics. This is uh, control of prices and salaries and the attempt to sort of normalize relationships during and after the war. Um, this is one of my favorites. This is a group of senators sitting in the chamber and it says uh, uh, anti-labor bill, and they're all there present and accounted for. And this one says uh, government business, vital government business, and they've all left. This could be the recent shutdown of the government. I mean, very little has changed in this country, you know? And this is, this is somebody grappling with the same issues that we are uh, from the point of view of satire. This is a race riot in Harlem, basically. Um, this is uh, a series of Cold War images uh, and you know, premonitions of the Cold War. This is a, a scary one that says, Nagasaki Wiki Wacky Woo. But of course, that means our bomb on them, and so on. And this is free enterprise. Anybody, again, who uh, you know, it takes a, a completely sort of a laugher curve, a laissez-faire version of capitalism should remember that you get a hangover eventually. Um, so on down the line. So all of these cartoons are of this nature. This begins art cartooning within the context of PM and other journals, uh, and there's some wonderful things. There's a kid in a playroom making paintings. This uh, is an image we can't see from this distance, but it says Chicago by Turner and so on down the line. And all around you see these are just pure graphic caprices, eyes. This is playing with a film frame. And then we have a very variety of uh, sort of standard humor topics for, uh, for a cartoonist in the same way, again, that any stand-up comic has a set series of jokes or anyway, attempts to have one. So this is uh, men and women, basically. This is the demon drink. But this you won't find elsewhere. These are a series of literary quotations woven into cartoons, which have some of the same topics, but then he cites the particular source. So one source here is William Shakespeare. Uh, Robert Browning is another one. I can't remember all the ones, but I can't see them at this, uh, this light. But so this is another genre altogether. Then this one is a lovely sort of piece of Americana. It's all built on uh, the quotation, what the Dickens or land of Goshens. Now, I don't know that there are that many people nowadays who have ever remembered hearing those expressions said in earnest, but they really were once upon a time, and they were corny then, but they were nonetheless relatively common. My mother was incapable of swearing, so what she would say was, ye gods and little fishes. So Land of Goshens is right up there with ye gods and little fishes. Um, we tend to move towards fuck and shit, but that's all right. Um, <laughs> it wouldn't make nearly as good a cartoon. So anyway, this is, this is wordplay, and since you see him playing with words on the other side, all of these things cross-reference, right? He is, he is, he's juggling ideas, spitting them off as fast as he can. Um, these are signs of depression, intima intimations of mortality. Uh, this is a, a, a complaint that there isn't more time in life. Uh, and this is 
a, a kid rattling a fence with a stick, which is kind of what he did um, with, his, uh, with his pen. Now, on this case, you see some background stuff that augments the dimensions. This is, a, this is a Reinhardt cartoon on the cover of PM. So again, if you opened your today's Daily News or whatever it is and had a first-rate cartoon not on the cover, I mean, the New York Times has barely allowed to have cartoons until recently, but to have one on the cover, that is unheard of. But at the same time, he was uh, working within a field where one made one's living by doing illustrations, and he had certain favorites, one of which was the ice cream industry. He was a great ice cream eater. And Anna has wonderful stories about going to get ice cream with him. And so here we have a heartfelt uh, ice cream ad. This is uh, Ruth Benedict, the anthropologist, did a book on racial tolerance, for which he did illustrations. This is an Anthavel CIO organizing manual. This is New Masses, for which he did a cover under a pseudonym, Mocking Roosevelt. And then another color cover, very sober, of Andre Malraux, who was then a very famous writer. This is Soviet Russia today, a magazine published in support of the Soviet Union. And that cartoon on the far side and this on the cover here are his work. And this, again, was very common in those days. This was not an exceptional thing. And there you have the gesture from, from Columbia and so on down the line. This is a book that he did, a, a children's story. And he was very friendly uh, with Crockett Johnson, who was a cartoonist famous for Harold and the Purple Crayon and for uh, a cartoon strip, which I love, called Barnaby uh, Conrad and Mr. O'Malley. And this is a Barnaby, excuse me, not Mr. O'Malley, Barnaby Conrad is a critic. Um, in any case, this is, this is his purely playful children's book versions. Again, if you think of the scope of activity in this room and consider that what was going on in that room was what he was primarily focused on, you get a sense of the magnitude of the imagination, skill, range, and so on that this man had. It's astonishing. And then he also turns out to have had a sense of humor about himself which is even rarer these days. Uh, and these are a series of cartoons, most of them published in The New Yorker, that mock black paintings. And he kept them. These are all from his own files. So this is, this is his way of uh, collecting, in a sense, uh, the same kind of uh, uh, work that was done by him about others. He collected it when it was done by others about him. And without knowing this for sure, I dare say, and as she's still here around her, probably tell us, uh, it's very likely that he knew a lot of these cartoonists because there was a kind of fraternity of cartoonists and people who did this work sooner or later got to know each other, partly because they published in the same places and competed for the same jobs and so on. So this last little book is a prayer. Now, whew, catch my breath. <laughs> um, in the next room, and I'm not going to take you in there, but you should go in there, and you should go in there before you go to the last room because you want to save the best for last. In the next room are these slideshows. Um, unknown to most people is that Reinhardt was a serious student of art history. There were two serious students of art history in that generation. One was Philip Perlstein, who got a master's degree at the Institute of Fine Arts, where I used to teach, uh, was a student of Urban Panofsky, the great Durer scholar, and wrote his dissertation on? Picabia. Exactly. Uh, which most people don't know. And if you look at Philip's paintings nowadays and think, ah, the crazy shit that's in those paintings is him being Picabia with this very sober style, then it, they make a whole lot more sense. Um, and by the way, the other thing I say always in this case is, remember that Philip Perlstein in 1950 painted Superman over Manhattan and a dollar sign, and his very best friend at Carnegie Mellon and his roommate in New York, Andy Warhol, did it 10 years later. Okay? So, now, in that room is the, are slides that uh, Ed Reinhardt uh, collected in and around his study of art history, which I believe lasted about a decade, also at the Institute of Fine Arts. He took courses, and he sat for exams, and he took extensive notes. And when he traveled, he would document what he saw with his own photographs and buy slides in those places where you could get good slides. And he put them together in slideshows. And Anna's wonderful. She talks about how she saw him do this, where he would just click off the slides, say very, very, very little, and let the juxtapositions of morphological similarities and cultural differences play off each other in the imagination, the critical imagination, of the people who were seeing them. And the people who were seeing them were his fellow abstract expressionists at the club. They were students of art history. There were students uh, of art classes at uh, Brooklyn College where he taught. And by the way, there was a moment when Ad Reinhardt, Mark Rothko, Louise Bourgeois, and Philip Perlstein all taught at Brooklyn College. Um, anyway, so these were a thinking device, they were a recording device, they were a critical device, and they were proof, again, of this incredibly broad education and in-depth education. He knew many, many cultures. His primary concerns actually were Asian. Uh, he was a real expert in both Islamic and Buddhist art, uh, and there are slideshows that reflect that. 
partly because Islamic art is iconoclastic, there aren't, there's no mimesis, and because Buddhist art represents this kind of transcendence of worldly entanglements, which was one of his principal concerns. Uh, so that you see in these slides all of that, plus uh, a little slap and tickle, uh, a little humor, a little this and that. There's, there's wonderful wit, and as uh, somebody looking at them uh, the other day was said, you know, every time you change categories, you change on a joke, a visual joke of some kind. He drops a slide in there that just twists something you've seen established, and then you're on to the next one. So go and look at that, take your time, and Andy Rutherford, who is Anna Reinhardt's husband, has been working on this and is going to augment it, so come back during the duration of the show, and uh, you'll see more. Now, if I were being paid full time to work in a museum, which is what I used to be, I would have done all of my homework, but it happens to be that I'm kind of a glorified freelancer, so I administer an art school, I write catalogs, I do exhibitions, and I don't have the time to focus that I used to, which means I don't know a few things. I don't know exactly how many black paintings in this format there are, and I don't know exactly how many black paintings there are overall, but there are quite a number of them. Uh, and if you go back through that room there, and I didn't point it out because I didn't want you to see it first. If you go back through that room, you will see in this case, at the very end closest to the door, a couple of sketches that diagrammatically lay out what he intends to do in these works and others like it. But there is a very substantial body of these works. The problem is that many of them have been damaged. The problem is that many of them have been damaged in particular by restorers who didn't know what they were doing or didn't care and were simply trying to pretty up paintings. This happened with Mondrian, for example. Sidney Janis had a lot of Mondrians repainted because they had cracks in them, and the result is that they're no longer Mondrians. Um, so to have a room full of paintings that are in this good condition, that are Ad Reinhardt paintings of this type, is an extraordinary thing. And this really is the labor of love of Anna herself. She, she worked on this like you cannot believe. She went out and stared collectors down and museum directors down and curators down and got the largest group of these paintings that anybody has ever seen, basically. Bill Rubin did a show in 1992 and there were nine. The show at the Jewish Museum was nine. This is 13. This is a lot of work of this kind and it makes it possible to make an installation that, that fits the room, basically. And so you feel an equalizing of tensions around the room uh, as a result of the, of the distribution and spread, which in turn allows you to actually notice how very, very different one painting is from the other. Uh, and the idea that, again, so many critics now have that these paintings are kind of uh, punctuation marks in the history of art, and they were made to make a point about the end of art, is a canard. Actually, they were made in order to be seen. And he made them by hand, and he remade them by hand also because when things were damaged, he would repaint them himself and the paintings would change to some degree. Uh, and so you're really watching somebody who has narrowed the range of possibilities about as much as you can and yet kept it open so that there's actually an enormous amount of variety. All of these are divided into a six-part pattern of squares, some of which arrange themselves in bands, some of which you know, pop a little bit. Uh, and all of them are, uh, in, have color in them, some of them quite pronounced color, some of it very subtle color, but these actually aren't black paintings. Um, these are a full spectrum of paintings in the lowest possible tonal register. And you're in luck because in daylight you see this much more clearly. Uh, as light changes, you will see some of them better and some of them less well. But that's another thing. These are living entities. These are, these are really, really painted paintings, and they are here to be looked at. That is what they are for. I mean, Reinhardt's insistence that art was just art, it didn't need to be anything else, was an insistence on art's own self-sufficiency, which is something we don't hear much now. You know? Art for art's sake is, a, is an aesthetic, ideological idea is one thing, and that's worth debating. But in Reinhardt's uh, version of it, it is not Oscar Wilde, it is not uh, art versus utility in the sort of 19th century way. It is simply the declaration that a complete art experience can be had and that a complete art experience is all you need to have. It doesn't need to have an alibi, a subtext, another reason for being. And what he did with these paintings was to, to demonstrate by example how many different ways one could do that and have a living painting. And it's interesting to see a photograph, which is in Bill Rubin's catalog, of him working on a painting where you can see uh, the undried brush marks and you can see how painterly these actually are. So if you say, for example, well, these are the uh, you know, sort of hard, rigorous, constructivist version of something in opposition to abstract expressionism, which was free, well, just check it out again. These, these are indeed very rigorous paintings, but they are also freely made. They are made by 
a process of intuition and direct execution, which is every bit in consonance with the things made by his contemporaries. Um, in any case, now, I will stop talking because the whole point of art like this is that I shouldn't add subtexts that aren't there anyway, right? So I would just recommend that you spend as much time in, as you can in this room over the next month and a half or however David can tell us how long it goes, but spend as much time as you can in this room, come back. This is not the Museum of Modern Art. You do not have to pay $25. You can just taste this at, at leisure, at will. So if you have a lunch hour uh, or uh, uh, whatever it is, if you can get yourself out of work early, just come here and be in this room for an extended period of time for the duration of the show and you will not be sorry. That's it.